Hello friends, I hope all of you are doing well and are in your best of health. Let us now begin, begin with a different aspects in terms of liability, that is vicarious liability. The discussion here will be spread over a few presentations since there are various aspects to the concept of vicarious liability which needs to be understood. Today we are going to look into the concept of what vicarious liability is, understand its meaning, look into the rationale of vicarious liability and then look into the aspect of master-servant relationships. The class will majorly be discussing with core concepts of vicarious liability and the master-servant relationship in terms of vicarious liability. Let us begin with the discussion. We have understood through different discussions that a person is liable for all the wrongful acts or we can say the tortious acts which are done by him and not for those acts which are done by somebody else. Thus, a person is liable for the wrongful acts which he himself does and not somebody else else's acts. However, there are certain cases in which a person can be liable for the tortious acts of, of somebody else and these are the cases which fall under the concept of vicarious liability. So essentially, vicarious liability means that a person is liable for the wrongful acts of somebody else. This arises when there is a relationship between the tortfeasor and the party who becomes vicariously liable, which justifies giving the latter the responsibility of the acts of the former. So for example, if an employer and an employee are engaged in a business and the employee does any tortious act, the employer can be held liable in, the, in terms of vicarious liability. What is of essence here and should be understood is that there should be a relationship between the tortfeasor and the party who becomes liable. In the absence of such a relationship, there will be no vicarious liability. You cannot be held liable for somebody unknown's tort, right? There has to be some, some connection between you and the person who commits that tort. So, in case of vicarious liability, there is a relation. Now, in course of the discussion, we will understand what is this kind of relation which is necessary to establish tortious liability. In general, there are some situations where tortious liability can arise. The first is master and servant relationship. We will look into that in detail in this presentation. The next is the principal and agent relationship. And in case of partners of a firm also, a partner can become vicariously liable for the acts of the other partners. We will basically discuss the two aspects that is master and servant relationship and principal and agent relationship. Vicarious liability is based on two Latin maxims. The first is qui facet alium facet per se that is he who does an act through another is deemed in law to do it himself. So in case of a master servant relationship the master who does his act through the servant is liable for the acts of the servant. Similarly, if you look at the partnership relationship between persons, if one partner does an act for the other, the partner can, the other partner can also be held liable because one who acts through another is deemed in law to do it himself. Similar is the situation between a principal and an agent. An agent does work on behalf of the principal. So in case a principal does gives any direction to the agent and he does that act, he is liable for the act so done. The next maxim on which the concept of vicarious liability is based is respondent superior. That is, let the principal be held liable. This maxim majorly applies in the case of principal agent and master servant. The rationale here is, that the principal or the master is in a better position to meet the claims because of his larger pockets that, that is better economic capacity and also has the ability to pass the liability to others through means of insurance. So a master or a principal has better capacity in terms of economic capacity to bear the liabilities and hence he will be responsible for the acts of the employee. Also, the employee works on behalf of the principal. So majorly, those are authorized acts. So if any tort is committed 
in lawfully doing authorized acts it should be respondent or the person who employs you to do that act who has to be held liable let us look at the master servant relationship in case of vicarious liability i will use the terms master and employer interchangeably and similarly servant and employee interchangeably the concepts remain the same now in case of a master and servant relationship if the servant does any wrongful act in the course of his employment the master becomes liable for such a wrongful act so if i employ x for purposes of my business and if in course of my business or in the course of the employment x does any wrongful act i will be liable for those acts so there are two essentials which have to be called out here that the tort has to be committed by the servant or the employee himself right if somebody else who is related to the servant or an employee does any act which might remotely be related to my business but it, the person is not my servant or an employee then i will not be liable and next is that it must be committed in the course of employment now there are two questions which arise here that who can be called a servant and what do you mean by course of employment in the subsequent presentations i will guide you through what these two terms mean now let us understand who a servant is a servant or an employee is a person who works under the master and works under the directions and control of his master what is important in case of a servant is that he has to be under the directions and control of a master now for example if there is a business there are a lot of people who work for the person who owns that business but not everybody will be a servant say for example there is a person who owns a shop and he has a few people working under him and he wants to expand his business and for that purpose he wants another room to be constructed so he hires a contractor to get that room made will that contractor also be called the servant or will he be an independent contractor or independent person the essence of what we are discussing here is to understand that a master is only liable for the acts of the servant and not somebody who is called an independent contractor this is very important to differentiate because there are cases where vicarious liability is fixed upon a person and he has to prove that the person who was working was not his servant but an independent contractor so let us understand what is the difference between a servant and an independent contractor the first is that the servant works under the direct control and supervision and directions of the master so if you are able to tell the person what to do the work to be done and to tell how that work has to be done and give proper directions and control his actions then he becomes your servant on the contrary if somebody is told what work has to be done but you cannot control how that work is done by him and you cannot cannot give him directions to do that work he becomes an independent contractor right a servant service is called a contract of service and independent contractor is in, get, engaged in contract for services he gives you services he does not do your service right so for example if you have employed a domestic help in your house he will be a servant but if you employ somebody to do some service where you cannot guide him on how the service has to be done that is called a contract for services and he becomes an independent contractor if he does any tort the master will not be liable for his tort in order to understand whether the relationship between a person is that of a master or servant or a master and independent contractor there are various tests which have been evolved there are basically two approaches which have been taken one is the traditional view and the other is the modern view we will look into the two approaches and a few tests to understand the, how to differentiate between an independent contractor and a servant now a few tests have been named differently by different authors however the essence of those remain the same i will look into the test of control 
in the traditional view first. Now this view endorses that the master is not only able to order what work has to be done, but he can also tell how that work has to be done. And hence it is called the test of control, wherein the master, in addition to giving directions on work, what work had to be done, also controls the manner in which the servant does that work. Right? So the master has complete control over the servant. And hence the name of the test, that is the control test. And if this is present, then the person becomes the servant, else he is the independent contractor. Because in case of an independent contractor, the master is not able to control how that work is done. So the essence of the traditional view and control test is the concept of the master being able to direct and control how the servant does this work. Why this is called the traditional view is because this was appropriate for the traditional master-servant relations, for the traditional setup. In the case of Short versus Henderson, there were four points which were laid down by Justice Tankerton, which demonstrated that whether it is a contract of service, that whether there is a master-servant relationship. The first was that the master had the power to select his servant, that is, the master's power of selection of his servant, which is absent in case of an independent contractor. The independent contractor is only told the work to be done. He can hire his own servants. The payment of wages and other remunerations. In case of a master, he himself pays the remuneration. However, in case of the independent contractor, the contractor is paid his remuneration and he later pays those remunerations to his servants. The master's right to control the method of doing work, which is absent in case of an independent contractor. And the master's right of suspension and dismissal. The master has absolute right to suspend or dismiss his servants. If these four factors are present, it is a master-servant relationship and not the so relationship of an independent contractor. As I have stated earlier, that this test of control, that is the traditional view, was appropriate for the traditional master-servant relationship, such as the laborers who worked on a daily wages because you could control them directly, or the domestic help, or in, so, for example, in case of a carpenter, because you could control him and tell him, direct him what to do, right? However, these are not appropriate for relationships the modern employer-employee relationship because these require high skill and professional knowledge in certain cases. For example, there are large hospitals today which hire doctors to work. Now, will they fall under the master-servant relationship according to the traditional view? Let's put the, them in the example. So, a doctor cannot be told how to do his job. He is skilled to do his job, so the owner of a hospital cannot tell him how to do it appropriately. That is to pinpoint how the work has to be done. He can be told what work has to be done. Similarly, if there is a captain of a ship and he knows how to sail the ship, somebody who owns the ship cannot tell him how that has to be done, right? So this test of control fails where there is some special skill or a professional skill which is applied. Hence, there are modern views which have been adopted, which do have the test of control as some part of their test. However, they do not rely completely on the test of control because these modern relationships between a person who is employed and the employer fail to give that effect. Similar is the case in an IT company. You can be told how to, to, make, to do a code. But you cannot be told how to write that code. It is upon you how you write that code, right? So this is why the traditional test of control failed and there was a need to adopt modern tests. And we will now understand two new modern tests which have been adopted and which are working to define the relationship between a master and a servant or whether that relationship is an independent contract. The first test in the modern view is the multiple tests or the economic reality test. Now, this multiple tests means that this test involves analysis through various checklists 
regarding the employment status of the person to determine whether he is a independent contractor or whether he is a servant now what is important here is to understand that this list is not an exhaustive list and not one factor is important here there are various factors which will be looked into at different depths to understand whether the person is an employee or not this was first brought in the ready mix concrete southeast limited versus minister of pensions case in this it was stated that there are three criteria to be satisfied to uh, to establish that the person is an employee now the first is that the person agrees to provide work and skill for the employer in return of the payment so the person has to agree to do work and to give the required skill in return of a payment now he has to expressly or by implication agree to be subject to the employer's control right and next is that the other terms of contract are consistent with the contract of service so there can be various other terms in a contract also and these have to be consistent to be terms of contract of service now this test includes control and organization testing that is the person able to control it and how is the organizational setup whether the organizational setup is such that the person is a servant or whether he is an independent contractor now this test acknowledges that each point is determinant but it also acknowledges that merely one of these points is not determinant in checking the employment relationship because the relationship is very complex so here each point becomes in equally important to decide whether the relationship is that of a employer and employee or that of a independent contractor because if you look at just one anybody can agree to give work in exchange of employment and in exchange of payment but he also has to have control and the other terms should be such that it does not entail that the person has a independent contractor status so the terms of the employment contract will be read as a whole to see whether the person is independent contractor or a servant now terms which could be inconsistent with a conclusion that the person is is a servant are that the person has to bring his own materials or he has to employ his own person to do that job right if the person brings his own material and he employs his own persons to do that job then the master or the employer cannot control those subsequent persons who are supposed to do that job and hence he will not be a servant and will be an independent contractor right so this is the difference and this is how small facts and small circumstances can twist whether the person is a servant or an independent contractor and the employer entire employment contract has to be looked into to determine the status so he, this discards that mere control is enough to put a person in the position of a servant let us look at the case of ready mix concrete to understand what this test essentially is now in this case there was a driver who contracted with a company which made premix ready mix cements and it delivered those concretes now here there was a contract which was executed between the driver and the contract uh, stated that the driver was an independent contractor and it set out the wages and everything for the driver now the company had certain conditions here the driver had to buy his own vehicle but paint it in the color of the company he had to drive the vehicle himself but the compliances with respect to repair and payment and other such compliances were to be done as per company's rule so what essentially this meant was that there was a driver who was employed to deliver certain concrete for the company and there were certain conditions which were laid down now there was a question which arose that the person is an employed person under a contract of service for purposes of insurance so the court here held that first whether a person 
is a master and in a master and servant relationship is determined on the basis of the contractual rights and duties and the nomenclature of the word used in the contract is not sufficient to prove it and it is rather irrelevant so the term independent contractor has been used in the contract but it will depend on the terms and conditions of the contract that whether a person is an independent contractor or a servant the court applies applied these three tests which were there which it laid down and it held that the driver had sufficient freedom in performance of his contractual obligations as he was free to decide the vehicle his own labor fuel and other requirements and because he was free to do so such things and the contract said that he was independent and there were no such other contrary things in the contract which said that he was not so the person was held to be an independent contractor and not an employee of the company so here because the terms and conditions of the contract were such that he had sufficient freedom and there was nothing inconsistent with his freedom hence it was held that the person is a independent contractor and not an employee the next test is integral part of the business test now this states that under a contract of service a person is employed as a part of the business and his work done is integral to the business so what work he does is integral and essential to the business however this is not in case of an independent contractor and the work is only ancillary and it can be dispensed with also now this was in the case of steven jordan harrison limited versus mcdonalds and evans now this case was that an engineer wrote a book that used the knowledge which he had acquired while working in a company in different capacities then he authored a work and under the copyright act it said that a con- if a work is done under done under a contract of service that is by a servant or an employee the copyright shall be by the person who employed that servant or an employee so the employer has the copyright if the work is done under a contract of service that is the person is a servant now the court here distinguished between a contract of service and a contract for service the court first applied the traditional control test concerning whether the person has the right to control the way in which the work is done the court further stipulated that a person is said to be an employee under a contract of service when the work is integrated in that of the business and considered an integral part of the business whereas an independent service is merely an ancillary to the business so contract of service is that the work is integrated and is integral part of the business and on the facts of the case the court concluded that the engineer's contract was mixed between the two at different times and held that the engineer was author of the work but the specific material that he acquired whilst he was an employee and therefore it should be excluded from publication the publication part and copyright part here is not as important as what is important to understand is that the person has to be integral part and ha- he has to be so integrated in the work of the business that he becomes indispensable if his work is ancillary to the business it is irrelevant so for example in an it company the work of the it professional is indispensable it is integral the work of the cleaning staff is something that is ancillary you can do away with it there is somebody else who deals with it so here the it person or the software engineer who is employed is integral to the business of the it company and thus he becomes a servant however the person who is kept for the housekeeping and management of the housekeeping he is ancillary he does not become integral to the it company and thus he can be an independent contractor and which is generally done by an independent independent contractor but the software engineer is integral to the business hence it is integral part of the business test the next element in the test of master servant relationship is that the act done by the servant has to be in the course of employment now act falls in the course of employment if 
it is an act which is authorized by the master and next or that it is an wrongful or an unauthorized way of doing an authorized act so first if the act is authorized it directly falls in the course of employment however if an authorized act is done in an unauthorized or wrongful manner it again falls in the course of employment so for example i have authorized my agent to deal with my clients if he deals with them fraudulently it still falls under the course of employment because i as the master am responsible for my agent because who will the person who has been fraud fraudulently dealt with hold liable so i am responsible for my agent similarly if i have authorized my driver to drive the car if he acts negligently and drives rashly i will also be liable for his acts he will also be liable but i will also be held liable justice wills had in a case held that the reason for liability of such acts is that in all these cases it may be said that the master has not authorized the act it is true he has not authorized a particular act but he has put the agent in his place to that do that class of acts and he must be answerable for the manner in which the agent has conducted himself in doing the business which it was the act of the master to place him in so he who does an act through others does it himself so if my agent does an authorized act wrongfully i am answerable for his conduct and i am answerable for any act which is authorized by me and during the course of employment which is done by the servant or the agent or for that matter a partner of the firm so this is what course of employment means in this presentation we have dealt with the concept of vicarious liability the concept of master servant relationship understood what a master and servant relationship is who is a servant the tests of how a master servant relationship is differentiated between a relationship between a master and an independent contractor and we have understood what course of employment means we will deal with specific instances of master servant relationship case laws relating to master servant relationship and the principal agent relationship and vicarious liability in the next classes and the classes to come any queries doubts or any feedback please mail me at shruti@mpdnlu.ac.in